Hi, and welcome to this demo on how to analyze survey openends and online reviews in three steps. My name's Maurice. I'm a techie by background. I'm a software engineer by training. Um, but my reason for being here is that I co-founded Kaplena roughly five years ago. And Kaplena, as you might already know, or shamefully not, is a software as a service for analyzing open-ended feedback. So what do we do? Well, we handle all kind of open-ended feedback, as already mentioned, that can stem from various sources, things like customer satisfaction uh, surveys, things like product reviews, but also employee feedback or even social media posts. The only kind of limitation that we have here is that we focus towards analyzing shorter responses, maybe up to a thousand characters on average, so that uh, is maybe half a half a page uh, of text. So it's still quite flexible. But if you're looking at qual data or long interviews, that is not what we are optimized for. The core of our software is then, of course, an augmented intelligence solution. I'm going to get to that in a minute, what I mean by augmented intelligence and what the difference is between augmented and artificial intelligence. And you may consume this service in a variety of ways. Either you can use the platform as self-service platform, or we do also offer some kind of uh, some additional managed services on top, especially for larger enterprises who require a bit more setup assistance or have special cases that they want to cover. And finally, you may also consume the service as an API if you want to have some automated um, transactions, automated processing of your data based on the analysis. And finally, we offer tools to present and analyze the generated insights. So these are mostly visualizations and interactive dashboards, which you can then share with your team or with other stakeholders within the company or even with your client if you are a market research agency. How do we get data into the application? And quick clarification here, we are mostly concerned with analyzing the data. So we don't do any collection. You bring the data to us. You can do that either uh, through a file. So we support numerous file types, Excel CSV, of course, but also SPSS. Um, or you can bring it into our application through our generic REST API, which you may connect to your own internal systems. And as second option, we have a number of integrations through which you can bring the data into Kaplena. There are basically two kinds of integrations that we have here. The ones are survey collection or customer experience management systems like Qualtrics, where you connect your account with your Kaplena account such that we can then get the data, for example, from Qualtrics into, into Kaplena directly and even synchronize that potentially on a nightly basis. So customers would want to do that because they might not be quite satisfied with the, the quality of uh, Qualtrics text IQ and want some more in-depth analysis. The second kind of data, and this is uh, sort of the exception to the rule I stated before, are reviews. And here we actually do some data collection ourselves. So we have eight different sites from Google Maps, Capterra, Trustpilot, G2, etc that we can scrape directly from within our application. So you will post one or more URLs, for example, that you want to scrape, and we will do that. And we will even uh, synchronize this uh, if you want us to. And one of the, the great opportunities with reviews is that as this data is publicly available, you may not only scrape your own data, but even that of competitors, meaning you can easily benchmark um, yourself against competitors with publicly available data. How does the platform work in general? And this is the last slide, bear with me before jumping into the application itself. Um, we are, as I mentioned before, an augmented intelligence platform. Now, I wanna explain the three steps on how to get to insights with us. And I hope by this, I will explain this term. So. First of all, we discover potential topics that appear in your data. So we say, well, we saw uh, there are topics about customer service, specifically the support is mentioned, the efficiency is mentioned, etc. But then you as a 
domain expert, you as a project manager, you may go into the interface, the user interface, and remove topics that you deem unnecessary, add your own ones that you would like to track um, or change them in, in any way, reorganize them in any way that you would like. In the second step, we auto tag your entire data set, be it 100 or 100,000 rows. So we will uh, categorize every row into one or multiple topics and uh, therefore allow you to quantify these results. But again, you as a, as a user, you may go in and fine tune the AI. You may review a couple of rows and thereby nudge it into the right direction, um, such to make sure that it actually does exactly what you want it to do. And we even have some metrics that we offer there where we uh, show a quality score, which allows you to gauge how well the AI learned what you wanted to do. And finally, we have the dashboard again, visualization tools. I'm not gonna go into these here. I'm gonna show them a bit more in the application. But by showing the principle here, I hope I have explained augmented intelligence because that is where we see a great potential for any kind of user app, basically. So a powerful AI, which uh, takes a lot of the heavy lifting for you, but the option for users to modify the AI's decision to nudge it in the right direction and to fine tune it easily. And all that without being a data scientist. So it's really a end user application um, with a huge degree of flexibility. So much intro, now I would like to jump into the application directly and highlight a couple of pages. First of all, the import data step. As mentioned before, you have different options here. Either you would drop your file here or which I quickly want to showcase is how to use the integrations. And again, there are accounts which you may connect from other systems such as Qualtrics or Zapier, but you can also directly scrape reviews for all these eight and counting review sites. And that is super simple. For example, if you're a service company, you might have Trustpilot reviews. So you just hit the Trustpilot pilot button and I'm just gonna copy one of the demo um, URLs here. Then you load a sample of the data which shows you some metadata like average rating and the total count. And then you continue to import this data into Kaplena. So very simple and very powerful. Um, maybe one or two other highlights I wanna mention. We have, for example, automatic translations integrated from either Google, Google Maps or DeepL, which you can activate with a single click. And we also have the option to anonymize text commands, which especially for enterprises is a highly valuable feature as it allows you to remove any kind of PII that may still be in your data. For the reviews, as said before, you also have the option to synchronize the results for example, on a nightly basis. Once you have uploaded the data, this will appear here. Here we have a number of example projects of which I'm gonna start with the consumer electronics one. So this is a survey where people were asked, I think to explain their satisfaction with uh, the last consumer electronics device they purchased. So a classical NPS study with an open-ended data set here. Now, the first step, as mentioned before, is generating the topics and doing that in this interactive fashion. For that purpose, we first of all choose what kind of data it is. It's a, a open text that has already been pre-selected by the application. There would be another kind of data that we have that semi-open or list type questions, but uh, that's mostly for things like unaided brand awareness. So we're gonna choose open text here. Now, in this step, you can choose a basis, a scaffold for your topic collection. And although it looks quite simple, it's pretty powerful. For example, you could upload a file if you have been given the topic collection or codebook, as it's also called in, in the market research lingo, um, you could upload that here and import it. But even more interesting, you can copy not only the topic collection, but also the AI's learning from another project into this one. So this is, of course, highly valuable if you have a monitoring study where you do similar kind of projects in a regular interval, or if you're 
you know, a larger agency or a larger research team, then you might do similar studies every now and again. And therefore, you don't have to start from scratch, but you can really choose what you have already done and base the AI's learning on that. And finally, we have templates here. So a number of hand curated templates for various industries, which you may choose as a basis. But in our case, we're just going to let the AI generate some topics. So the selection of a template or uploading a topic collection is completely optional. And in many cases, it will be absolutely sufficient for the AI to generate your topics. And this has now happened. So we see that the AI has arranged the topics in a two-level hierarchy. We have what we call the category. And then within the category, quality, for example, within the category, we have a number of different topics, things like trustworthiness, product quality, service quality, et cetera. And my job as a user is now to go through this and kind of make sense from this, see if this suits my needs, if there are any topics in here that I might not want to keep. For example, there is one called meets my needs. Well, that's a bit too generic for my taste. I'm just going to remove it. Uh, there's also, I think we have the, the quality of our screen quality. And here we have the image again. So I'm also going to remove the image. And in this way, you would go through and adapt this topic collection to your needs. And one of the very cool features is our zero shot learning capabilities. What does this mean in, in non-technical terms? Well, you may add a topic here. Uh, let's create one called reliability. And this topic without giving the AI any further ind indication of what I mean by reliability, this topic will already be applied in the next step as soon as I hit save. So in a real world example, I might spend five or 10 minutes on this page to get a, you know, a good first draft of my topic collection and then hit the save button. And what happens now is that the AI starts going through all these rows and usually it's very quick. I think this was a data set of about a thousand rows. It has gone through these 1000 rows already and done the initial categorization. We can see an overview of the results here already on the left-hand side. And we can see the structure again of the category, so quality, and then the different topics within that uh, category section. Furthermore, we can also see that a topic level sentiment analysis has already been performed. So you can see how many people actually mentioned the quality in a negative, in a neutral, or in a positive way. And the same um, also for the specific topics in here. And this is one of the very powerful features of our AI because there are a lot of tools that do sentiment analysis in some way, but you want, usually you want the analysis to be done on a topic level on, and not on an overall level. And let me quickly jump into the detail view to illustrate what this means. So as I said before, you may now optionally fine-tune the AI, nudge it into the right direction. And this is what happens in this specific view. So here you can see every row with the associated topics that have been assigned. Now, what you see here is the topic level sentiment. So the price was mentioned in a positive way. And then there's also the overall sentiment, which for the entire verbatim is positive. But to really make an in-depth analysis, you will want to have this topic level sentiment analysis. And in this view, you may now review a couple of rows, maybe a couple of dozen rows, and add topics that have not been assigned. That is either because the AI didn't understand it or more likely because the topic doesn't really exist yet. So you can go through the, a couple of rows, review them, and also add potentially missing topics. So let's have a look at this one. It says the uh, the apps available are a little limiting and the phone casting doesn't work great. So I would create a new topic, let's call it limited and put it in a new category called app. And then I have added this and now I'm gonna add it as a negative sentiment version here. And the cool thing is that as I make some corrections here and go through a couple of rows, the AI will update its predictions in the background every now and then. 
and based the categorization logic on the adaptions that I have made here. So it will learn from the changes that I have made and apply them to the rest of the data. And in this way, you can, with very little effort, get to a super high um, degree of quality. Let's have a look at what we are able to do once we have actually completed our analysis. And again, just stating that this topic assignment and reviewing step is actually optional. You don't have to do it, but for an important, a larger project, we would recommend doing it um, just also to have some kind of perceived indication of the quality of the output. Let's jump into the visualizations module. And here you have a variety of options of what you can do. You have, again, this basic sentiment level topic count chart, where you see how often the topics appear and uh, how often they have each sentiment. And as all charts, are, this one is also interactive, meaning you can open and close specific buckets. You can click into a specific bucket and see which verbatims are actually behind this, which is, of course, a great feature for stakeholders. Uh, if you create a dashboard later on for the marketing people and the dashboard for the product people, they can still dive into these specific sections and get an understanding of what people specifically said um, and also their tone. Then we have, of course, also a very general bar chart where we just get the distribution of topics without their sentiment. We have a trend chart, so there is not too much data here, which makes it a bit bumpy, but here you would be able to see how the share of topics has changed over time, how the distribution has changed over time, which is, of course, highly valuable if you have a, a continuously running study, like an NPS study, or if you do scrape these reviews, for example. You can see which topics come up, which topics have um, maybe changed over a certain period of time, and where you need to look into them. Another option are tree maps. Tree maps are a great way to get an overall distribution, overall overview of how things look like. And again, as everything, it's interactive, so you can zoom into specific parts and um, then also click their respective buckets to see what is behind them. A correlation chart, I think this is somewhat unique in our application, that you get uh, the how strongly different topics actually correlate with each other, how often they appear together, normed by how often they appear in general. Quite an interesting one. And then another one is the comparison chart. Here I might use other data that I have in my data set to uh, segment this. And this is an option I haven't talked about a lot yet, but when uploading your data, we don't actually only ingest your open-ended columns. We ingest all of the data. And you can then use these other columns, be they numerical or multiple choice data or demographics, whatever they are, you can then use that data to segment or slice and dice the results. And this is what has happened here. So we have one column called manufacturer in our data, and we can now dynamically compare, for example, Apple versus the average, the others in this chart. We could also look at how Google behaves, how LG behaves, etc. Then we have two charts for the satisfaction score. So if you have a NPS or CSAT or some kind of other satisfaction score, you may display that here. And we also have a driver analysis. So here you can see how impactful certain topics are on the overall satisfaction score. So it lets you explain the importance of an overall satisfaction score on something like the NPS or rating, which is of course highly valuable as um, many executives nowadays will have the NPS as part of their OKRs. And they, of course, want to know, how can I get my NPS up? And this is something you could do with such a chart here. And finally, just uh, some, some basic charts for the distribution of the sentiment or the a simple row count. Now, these charts are highly flexible and can then be added to dashboards. I'm not going to, it's again, a super simple process, but I'm just going to show you an example result, how this might look like. And this is the same data set. Again, it's the consumer electronics data set where people were asked, uh, correcting my previous 
um, a bit fuzzy definition. How likely is it that you would recommend your television set to a friend? That is the question which was asked with a thousand participants in the US market. And here you can then combine various of these charts um, into a interactive and shareable dashboard. You may also add explanations or point out to specific numbers you discovered and really highly customize this towards your specific needs. So much for the application in a nutshell. I do hope this gave you a quick overview and just a, a general remark, of course, when you reach out to us after this session, we will be happy to you know, dive more into the details of the application with you specifically and also discuss your specific use case that you might have and give recommendations if our application is the right potential solution for that or rather not. Coming back to the presentation, there's one quick topic I want to touch on, and that is the, the differentiation to other tools. I hear that question already through the virtual event, and I want to touch on that briefly. So there's, there's two main other kinds of solutions out there, and one is a keyword solution. This is actually until about a year ago, this was probably the most common case. So your solution would output specific keywords, things like service, Verizon, good price, and would then count them. And that is, of course, a huge difference to what we do because we really do a contextual analysis where you get the uh, assignments in a, in a hierarchical way. And I also want to know much more than just how often was service mentioned because service can mean the, the customer service, it can mean the network service, et cetera. So I really need a deeper understanding of these topics, which is what we do. Now, the second kind of competitor we see out there are solutions that use mostly off the shelf AI algorithms that have become amazingly good in the, in the past one or two years, but there the issue is often the customizability. And we see that with many of our large enterprise clients or not, not only them, actually even, even small ones, but oftentimes they want to track very specific topics. And um, I want to show an example here from Lufthansa. So Lufthansa uses us and they have 400 different topics that they want to track in their CX questionnaires. I'm just making this up now, but might be the responsiveness of the in-flight entertainment system. And with many of the other solutions, you would either have a huge effort to add that specific topic to the tracking, or you would need to spend a lot of effort on really giving loads of examples. And in our application, I've, I've shown it before, adding a topic is a, is a thing of seconds, and then fine-tuning it can often be done if necessary at all with within maybe half an hour or so. So a really high flexibility that we offer and a very high quality of output that is generated through it. And I think this has convinced many of these clients here. So we have around 140 clients in total, a lot of blue chips and big names, but also uh, market research agencies, startups and apps that use us to analyze their feedback. And maybe one last word on the results. So we really try to produce meaningful, actionable results, not only fancy words and taglines, but you can really quantify and dig deep in our application. And this has produced measurable results for these companies. For example, and this is one of my favorites that the CEO of eBay looks at our dashboards every second month to see what are the biggest pain points of his customers. So much from my side, I really do hope you enjoyed this quick presentation. And again, if you are interested in looking into the application more in details, if you have specific use cases that you would like to discuss, or if you just in general are unsure about text analytics, I'm, I'm also giving some trainings there for associations like MRS. So if you have anything you would like to know about text analytics, then please feel free to reach out to me anytime. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Maurice. And uh, I'm hoping that our audio and video is all fine now. Can you hear me okay and see me okay? 
I can hear you perfectly, yes. Amazing, how wonderful. Hopefully they've fixed the issues we were having yesterday. Great, um, wonderful presentation, very clear, and uh, some great examples there at the end as well. Um, we have a question from Maria, and I think just because it was something towards the end there about the hierarchical topics, she's asking how many levels for those hierarchical topics can you have? Uh, does that make sense as a question, or do we need a bit more clarification? No, that absolutely makes sense. So there are uh, two levels of hierarchy which you can uh, ch freely choose, the, as we call it, category and the topic. Uh, of course, arbitrary. I, I know there are a lot of different names for these different levels, but uh, two levels that you can freely choose. And then there is a, a third level, um, which is fixed to be the, the sentiment level. So each topic can have um, can be either positive, negative, or neutral if you choose to activate uh, the sentiment. So um, in general, three, but two of them are are um, free to choose, and, and one is sort of predetermined to represent the sentiment. Right. So like when you had like the app, uh, you created the new category for the app or the new topic, and then it was the uh, or what it was the level within it, and then you then it was kind of positive or negative sentiment within that. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Not quite yeah. sure the selection or something like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. well, and then uh, the sentiment sure. within yeah. that, exactly. Yeah. yeah, okay, great. Um, you finished up there talking about generic models and, um, you know, some of the, I guess, you know, the, the ones that are, are quite well known these days now with like GPT-3 and, um, you know, I guess Google Lambda and some of the other uh, broader models. Um, you so yours is entirely proprietary or do you work with any third party models at all or do you do you kind of customize them how does that work right um so we of course we we have based our models on on publicly available research right that's not um it's not that we uh, completely reinvented the wheel so it's a a transformer based model yeah. um in general and um but then it, it's quite heavily customized uh, below uh, up to to a very low level as well um to to be optimized towards this specific uh use case and um that is you know both for the for speed but also for for quality these two are the parameter or the the metrics that we want to optimize for um so it's 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 on the one hand you know both a um a highly customized architecture but on the other hand i think just as important is the the training data and um, yeah. as many of these models work it is pre-trained on publicly available data so they there you have these kind of um you you remove single words and you ask the model to predict which words would now fit into um the the missing parts that's how we pre-train it that's very similar how others uh, do it as well um, of course not not on the same not quite on the same scale as these gpt3 but still um, a pretty pretty large scale pre-training that we do there but then comes a further step in our application and that is uh, that we train it on all the review data that we have on our platform and i think that is really uh, quite unique we have about uh, 200 million rows that were processed on the platform so far and of these 200 million, we have maybe six or seven million that were hand reviewed by um, users, by customers, by us. And yep. um, these hand reviewed examples are, of course, you know, highly valuable training data um, and very specific to this to this purpose, um, which allows us to also get this these zero shot capabilities so out of the mm. box uh, predictions yeah. without having to do any kind of, of fine tuning okay so they so they will have been manually labeled by either you know you or customers or a third party and it's a it's maybe it's a bit more of a niche thing like you say you know the, the in-flight entertainment you know um, issues things like that is that what you're talking about Exactly, exactly. So I mean, um, it's this this uh, yeah combination, um, this augmented intelligence approach, as mm. I explained it, um, mm. where often people will review a small percentage of their data, a couple of dozen, maybe uh, sometimes a hundred rows, and over over the last couple of years, this has amounted to this quite substantial amount of of training data that we can now use, and that which is provides the basis for every new customer, which is kind of nice because it it gets better over time um, yeah. by itself by incorporating this new data um, without us having having to actual 
actually change the architecture to get yeah. better. Of course, this is something which we periodically do as well, but that's kind of a bigger exercise. Um, sure. And this this uh, new training data allows to also just uh, yeah profit from from all the work that has been put into the platform by yeah. by all the users. Great. So, what's what would the process be if, um, let's say, you know, a new category or a niche, um, you know, sort of, let's say, something in B two B, where it's you know, it's not really been part of the existing model. What's the process that would then happen to make sure that you know you could optimize for that that new data type? Right. I mean. Um... The the process is is very is still the same as I as I showed it um, in the in the demo. You upload the data, uh, you let the topics be generated. Of course, uh, if it's a very specific domain, we you know there might not it might not cover all the topics that you need. You might need to uh, add a couple yourself manually that that you think are relevant, and then you would this, do this uh, reviewing process where you let's say it's an ad hoc study where you ask um, you know a thousand of your um, your customers or your um, whoever stakeholders um, or your your um, employees maybe as well mm -hmm. and then if it's again it's a very specific domain so you might need to review a hundred of them um, manually to to sort of train the system but reviewing manually is still of course much less work than than doing this from scratch in Excel because yeah. you already have yeah. some suggestions oftentimes you just need yeah. to confirm it time. correct um, uh, uh, so it's it's you know, if you uh, are uh, more or less used to the system, you will get through a hundred rows within maybe uh, half an hour or so. So it's sure. uh, it's still a, a, a yeah a lot more effective than than doing this than doing this manually or in yeah. Excel. Yeah. Yeah. And right. um, maybe one 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 more point on that process. Um, uh, an important thing there is, of course, that people. I mean, we started off with market research agencies as our customers, mm -hmm. and uh, one point that is very important to them is the quality of the coding, the quality of the topic yeah. assignment, right? Um, because if you deliver something back to a client, then you want to be sure that it's it's really it's it's actually makes sense and it's dependable the number that you deliver back. So um, what we do in our platform as well that we always take a sample of your reviewed um, rows and compare it to the predictions of the AI. And then right. we compute a quality metric. It's it's called the uh, F1 score, which is you know, a scientific metric, a bit more strict than pure accuracy, especially for imbalanced data mm -hmm. sets. And um, this quality score then you know, gives you an indication of how good the uh, AI's coding matches with yours and you know, lets you uh, sleep sound and safe uh, after right. having delivered that back to your client, which I think also is quite, it's quite unique that we're so transparent in what kind of quality you get out of the system. Okay, okay, good. Oh, that's great. I learned something there, the F1 score. Very good. Um, uh, Maria has a, has a sort of follow-up comment or question about NPS. I think, um, I think you're suggesting that, you know, NPS is, I mean, as a broader comment you know there are some limitations to it and the way in which it's bucketed and the stories you can kind of you know tell from it um it does make it i think better suited to certain categories and uh, and applications than others for sure i i think that's what you're saying but um i'm sure that's borne out in the in the work that you do as well maurice um any other questions from uh, from the audience please post them here while we're chatting we'll make sure that we we cover them before we wrap up um, Maurice, you showed the the correlation chart as a as a sort of unique visualization or something that's you know that's quite specific to you. Um, looks fantastic. Can you just maybe talk through like what's a, what's a sort of practical use case or an example of how you know how that might um, lead to an insight or you know how do you how do you interpret that correlation chart into something useful? Um, right. I mean, uh, for example, it, it might, um, um, if you have uh, a web app that you are analyzing and getting feedback for, and you notice that um, uh, certain uh, topics are frequently mentioned together, like, I don't know, re responsiveness and um, the... Um, um, feature XYZ, then you yep. can sort of, um, you know, it guides you into the direction that you should look at these two together. And often they 
um, they they might be um, related in some way, yeah. Um, yeah. and and uh, that you should look into that in in more depth. And so what we often see is that we when when you have these correlations, a high correlation between topics, then um, users will go on to filter for uh, mentions of these two specific topics and sort of dig deeper on what right. the Allow, yeah. uh, what the the reason behind that is so there is often a a, a, a common reason behind these two uh, topics yeah. when when yeah, you see yeah, them yeah. highly correlated okay great so it's an exploratory kind of you know causal analysis uh framework yeah yeah okay absolutely great. um good and then just some sort of basic things like you know if uh you know surveys especially you can get a lot of you know incorrect spellings come in or, or things like that how how would you cope with something like that in the in the platform um right so m maybe a short short background here so language models used to work on a uh, word level mostly that you would uh, compare entire words mm -hmm. and there of course you have the problem that if one character is different then uh, you know the word wouldn't be recognized at all because it would be represented totally different uh, in the system yeah. what happens nowadays in most cases is that you look at tokens uh, and tokens can be uh, somewhat comparable to syllables that you look at single syllables of words and uh, then only the, the combination of the syllables is then interpreted as a uh, as a, yeah, a common entity or something yeah. um, and with this approach you have some resiliency towards spelling mistakes so it can still even if one uh, syllable is different it can still be recognized as the same context as the same um, concept um, it's of course not, you know, it's not quite yet as uh, um, understanding as a human would be towards misspellings, but there is uh, some resiliency. And in in the cases, in most of the cases that we deal with, um, it doesn't actually change the outcome of an analysis completely. So if you have a couple of misspellings, that's that's totally okay. Of course, if you have, you know, extremely dirty data, if you have, I don't know, WhatsApp chats, then it it might be a, a challenge, but yeah. uh, with the usual kind of customer feedback, the, those spelling mistakes don't actually change the outcome significantly. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so just, I, I think to wrap up, we don't have too many other questions coming in, but just, you know, there's a lot happening in generative AI, you know, large language models. It's, I guess, quite an exciting time to be in an in a AI business. What do you, uh, is, so I guess two, two parts to this question. Is there anything on your roadmap that you can share or talk about that is in the more generative AI space? And then more broadly, how do you see these large language models playing out over the next few years? Any any sort of big impact on our industry? Right. Um, I mean, first of all, in, in our case, we are, of course, or have, I mean, this is not a completely new development for us, right? We have been um, um, working with, with generative models for, for quite a bit already and have uh, since about one year, they already are incorporated into our product specifically for the topic generation part. And that is a part we are also actively working on. So not, not only the classification, but really the initial topic detection. Um, and what we want to do there is, or what we are in the, in the process of completing actually, and we'll be releasing hopefully in about a month or so, um, is a more interactive topic generation schema. So again, this, this playing together, the human and the AI that, that we suggest topics, but we want to uh, go further and then make specific recommendations saying, hey, you know, we have discovered these two topics. Can you make sure that they are actually, um, that they are uh, meaningful, that they are not the same thing? Um, okay. And then we say, we might say, okay, we have detected uh, this, uh, this category where we think you should, um, you know, add something further. So being much more specific in, in the way that the AI and the human collaborate to make it much easier for the human to, um, to, to grasp the entirety of the topics mentioned. So that is uh, something where we're actively employing this technology and we'll be um, making much more use of it uh, still in the future. Okay. Um, in the in the general space, um, I think on the maybe the, maybe the first area that it that will be strongly influenced by this in, in market research or 
in the first area. One of the areas that, that will be uh, influenced uh, first is maybe the, the reporting part um, yeah. where you might have um, solutions that will, you know, create a, a a, a, a written summary maybe of, yeah. of some some results and and well summarize some some quantitative or qualitative findings for you um, without you having to to do that manually so I think there uh, we'll see these kind of applications soon I still think it's you know in maybe in in general for at least for the next couple of years um, I, I still see it as a you know a tool it's not that it replaces any yeah. kind of work entirely but it's a tool which makes your your job easier um which lets you be more productive um but i still do think it does require and i think it's also you know that most people still see it this way that it does require the, the supervision uh, of a of a professional um like, like any professional tool does right it's, yeah. it's a tool yeah. which requires a, a professional yeah. to use it yeah Okay, good, good insights. Thank you. And um, yeah, I see a lot of innovation happening around that, um, you know, conversational interfaces for analysis, whether it's on, you know, uh, kind of data visualizations or generating summaries of, you know, uh, of data or um, summarizing open ended, you know, long form qualitative data as well. There's a lot, lot of new tools seem to be emerging there. Good. Okay, well, thank you very much for a fabulous demo and for answering our questions. And thank you to those of you who joined. I hope you'll stick around for some of the other sessions that we have later this afternoon. The next one we have is with Discuss, which is a video-based qualitative research platform for one-to-one -one interviews, focus groups, and uh, mobile ethnography and self-captures and UX research. So hopefully you'll come and join uh, me and Jill for that demo in about 15 minutes. Then afterwards, I'm going to take you through some broader principles for how to select technology. If you're a, a buyer, if you're an in-house research team or an agency, some principles that you should look at when selecting technology. And then we'll round off the afternoon with Uscan. So Uscan Social Listening and Visual Analytics, uh, another AI-based platform for understanding uh, you know, what's out there and what people are posting in social media. So Maurice and uh, Kaplena, thank you very much for your demo and your time. And I hope you'll all join us in about 15 minutes for our next session. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Steve. Have a great day. Thanks.